Welcome to the Business Men and Women of Color podcast. I am your host, Ann Austin, and it is my pleasure to bring quality programs to all of you. I am so excited again to be here with another phenomenal and influential speaker today. It's going to be exciting. We have lots to share. So please stay tuned and listen to this podcast as well as all the podcasts on all the pages on this platform. These folks are phenomenal. They are from all walks of life and all different types of industries. So please make sure you take advantage of this unique opportunity because you cannot get it anywhere else. Just in case you did not know, the purpose of the Business Men and Women of Color podcast is not only to just network our business, but we're here to share information for the working professional and career seekers who are looking to get into their line of work. We also want to take a moment to thank our corporate sponsors and partners, our family of authors, Butler Homestead Consulting Solutions, Human Resource Learning Center, JNF Enterprises and Women Offering Wealth, along with many of our other partners and sponsors who is helping to make this season a success. So today we're going to get into the media. We have several people on the podcast so far that's in different platforms of the radio, TV, personality, and today we're going to talk about just the influence of small businesses when it comes to digital media. And so today we have a phenomenal guy who's been in the media for over 27 years. So we're going to bring on to the podcast Mark Hayes. Mark Hayes is a news anchor with WLWTV5 in Cincinnati, Ohio. He is an Emmy-nominated news anchor, and he brings nearly three decades of television experience and passion for community service. Chasing his dream of playing college football, Mark attended Howard University, where he majored in their top flight communications program and earned his Bachelor's of Arts degree in the class of 1989. As the letterman on a 1987 varsity football team, the Bison were crowned Mid-Eastern Athletic League champs and were inducted into the University Hall of Fame in 2014. His journalism career began as a tiny vision. However, while working in Albany, Georgia, he was a one-man band covering everything from high school sports to U.S. Senate campaigns, and that led him to take a leap to Rochester, New York, where he worked in doing journalism there and where he went to Denver, Colorado and earned his first national award from National Press Photographers Association for covering news during the riot at the Red Rocket Amphitheater. And so he has so much going on in his bio. I want everybody to take a moment to read his bio so you can get the full breadth and scope of his experience. And with that, Mark, welcome to the podcast. Well, thanks so much for having me. What an honor and a privilege to be here. Thank you. I'm so excited to have you here. And you have such a phenomenal background all the way from football to now being a news anchor. So I want to break this down into a way that we can kind of understand who you are. You know, how did you get into football? And what was that aha moment that said, you know what, I want to do journalism? Uh, You know, it all started when I was a kid. Um, You know, playing football on the block with my friends, and that's back when kids used to play outside, (laughs) you know, because I've been around for a minute. But, um, you know, we we used to uh, go outside and have pickup football games, and I fell in love with it. I would watch it all day, every day, and uh, when the VCR was finally invented, I would record football games and, and talk about them. And I wanted to be a sports broadcaster after my NFL career. Uh, which was my first dream, but um, unfortunately it didn't work out that way. But I had a great experience at Howard University and um, back through high school and junior high school with football. I made some lasting friendships to this day um, from some of my teammates. Um, of course, our Bison um, Mid-Eastern Mid- Mid- Athletic uh, Championship team is very close to this day. And, uh, you know, we still keep in touch with each other and, and keep tabs on each other to make sure everybody's in good health and, and, and wealthy and wise. And so it's, it, um, you know, that team atmosphere that you love so much and that you miss so much about sports. 
And it was what kind of drew me to news because it's so competitive. TV news, especially on the local level, very competitive. You know, you're always out to beat the other guys. And we, um, I, it kind of filled that competitive void for me after I left college and, and uh, intercollegiate sports. So it was something that um, helped uh, fuel that competitive nature in me. Um, it, it's a lot of fun. You never do the same thing twice. And it is... Um, you, you, you just meet so many interesting people and so many amazing stories. And over the course of 27 years, I've, I've just come into some of the most amazing people um, doing the most extraordinary things uh, in our communities and around the country. And I've, I've had the privilege of working around the country. Some don't call it a privilege, but I like to look at it that way because I've, I've been in different parts of the country like Denver, Dallas, Detroit, uh, Baltimore, Atlanta. Um, so you, I, I've gotten a really nice feel uh, for people around the country and gotten to know some phenomenal people that I'm in touch with to this day. So the aha moment was when I realized that it was going to be very difficult to get sports jobs because those guys don't leave those jobs. I mean, they're great jobs and nobody uh, really wants to leave a job when they can go to the Super Bowl and get paid for it and, and have an opinion about it. And, exactly. And, and everybody watches. So, um I got offered a news job down in Albany, Georgia, and I jumped at it. And I had gone down to meet with the news director, and we talked. And I, I, I said, you know what? This is for me. I love this game, and I love the the, the way that um, you know we talk, we get to tell great stories, we get to meet great people, and then we get to do it all over again the next day with something totally different. And, um, you know, and I just remember I was covering Weiss Fowler's uh, Senate campaign back when I was in Albany, Georgia. And, you know, I might, I might be doing that on a, on a Friday and then on a Saturday I might be covering the high school basketball playoffs. So, it, it, you know, just the diversity of uh, topics and um, just a wide variety of people and stories. And it, it never gets old. It never really gets old. Wow, fantastic. Okay, so what I want to do is kind of focus a little bit about your experience specifically in journalism and maybe just giving the listeners and particularly the ones who are looking to get into this field some idea of the real world of journalism behind the camera. Um, Some of the things that you had to go through, any courses or training classes that you had to take because this is the second journalism podcast that I'm having and we don't get a lot of teaching in terms of how to get into journalism or what is the real world of what do you need to do to become a good journalist and I want to get your professional opinion to kind of speak to those listeners for that. Yeah, you know, it's interesting, too, because getting a job in, in, in television is not like uh, most corporate American uh, corporate America positions. You have to really understand how to look for work. I remember when I was first trying to apply for, for jobs and trying to get hired, there was I, I was going about it all wrong. And I, I didn't even think to myself that, wow, I need a resume reel. I need somebody to see how I look on television. And so it, it hadn't even occurred to me, and no one told me. And I'd done a couple of internships. And finally, I had someone, you know, take me under their wing and say, look, this is what you need. You need a resume, a resume reel, and you need to send it to different places strategically so that you can find people that will help you uh, shop your skills and, and your ability um, to find the right fit. Because we're, we're as, and when we're starting off, we're looking for someone to take a chance on us and say, okay, I see that this person has the basics and they're smart, they're driven, they're hungry. And, and that's what people are looking for in their first job, someone to take a chance on them. So once you understand the basics and that you need that resume reel and you have to get that together, um, then you can start looking for jobs and the consult there are TV consultants that will help you find work because they're being paid by the television stations to find talent for them. And then you can look now it's so much easier too with, with the digital influence because you can look up jobs and different job sites. Um, NABJ.org is great for uh, journalists of color, um, the Hispanic journalists um, organization as well. And so with these organizations and being able to do the research uh, right on your computer and fire off a link 
uh, it makes it so much easier. So these kids now, you know, they understand how to edit. Um, they can put their own resume reels together because all of them now in their college coursework, they're shooting their own video, they're editing their own video, and they understand the process and they have the skills. So they are marketable already, especially for now, because the, the, the entire business is so rooted in a digital presence right now, they have to be efficient at it. So if they can do those basic things, they're automatically marketable. You don't necessarily have to have a journalism degree, although the way things are changing with the digital influence and the, the, the speed at which we are asking our reporters to, to uh, impart information, I, I think it's more critical than ever that we understand the basic tenets of journalism and understand how to be fair and accurate and uh, crisp and clean with our reporting so that we're not opening ourselves up uh, to mistakes. And because now you, when, you're, when you're racing against the Internet, first of all, you have to understand that you're never going to win. <laughs> you're never going to be able to keep up no. with the speed of it's Twitter just, yeah, it's and too Facebook. Much. <laughs> right. Yeah. So you ha we have to focus on doing good, solid journalism. And, and that's, that's the frustration that, you know, us dinosaurs have right now. Um, as as opposed to, and, and that's why we have take such issue with the, the term fake news. Um, but but young people need to understand that it is rooted in in, in a digital presence. Um, our websites are uh, driving the competition. You know, we're trying to get all our viewers um, that are connected to us on the web to come over to our broadcast. And soon, you're probably going to see. Uh, newscasts on demand, where we're just doing a series of newscasts throughout the day, and you just pick out the one that you want to watch. Uh, be because we're competing so much with the internet, these young kids these days, I'd say 30 and under, I they probably, most of them probably don't even know how to go about getting a cable subscription. All they know how to do is turn on the internet, you know, when they move into their apartments. So, you know, we have to go where the customers are, and that's the changing part and the dynamic that, that the young and up and coming journalists need to understand that, you know, five years from now, it's going to look very different than what it is now. Yeah, definitely things are changing with technology. And that means, and I always say this, is that as technology changes, so does job requirements and skills. Mm -hmm. And it's forever changing because we as the people is driving all of these changes with the speed in which things are happening, the way the Correct. platform and smoothness and also the generations that are coming up and learning how to do technology at the age of two and three and four years old. Mm -hmm. This is driving. We are the ones that's driving this change. And so we have to evolve with it. So one of the questions that I wanted to ask particularly when it comes to minorities in journalism, in your experience, how are we standing in terms of minorities as journalists? I see what I see on the media, and I'm only controlled about what I see on the media, but on the back mm -hmm. end, on the behind the scenes, how many of us is really not taking advantage of this industry? Well, you know what? We're, we're just not there. I mean, we need a better presence behind the scenes. And, and exposure is my issue. We're not exposing enough kids of color to the great positions that uh, are operating in newsrooms. I mean, we have executive producers, managing editors, line producers that produce each half hour of each show. And so there are great jobs behind the scenes, management positions. You don't often see... Uh, people of color in management positions, which is why we get into issues about the way we're portrayed in news broadcasts and the way that we are utilized. Um, you know, so if you don't have people of color at the top, it's hard to get a trickle-down effect and to get people of color uh, in front of the camera and in decision-making positions. So when I go out and I speak to young people at colleges and high schools, I tell them, hey, expose yourself to this. If you're interested in journalism and you don't want to move to seven or eight cities during the course of, of your career, check out the behind-the-scenes game because there are so many great positions and great career paths that they can be on. And those are the folks that can institute change. Those are the folks 
that can make a difference with the way we're portrayed uh, on television and in the media because they can change the experts that we use, for example. If you've got a story about uh, uh, a legal issue, well, why not look for uh, a person of color? If we've got immigration issues, why not look for a person of color? Just don't go, you know, we, we, we tend to gravitate toward what's familiar. And that doesn't necessarily have to always be uh, a majority influence. So the people that are making these decisions um, need to be need to be more diverse. Um, and I push. I, I am a big proponent of that because over 27 years I've worked for one African American general manager, and that's here um, within the last three years here in Cincinnati, and. Um, I, I can probably count the number on one hand that I've met during the course of 27 years. So there are just not enough out there um, in terms of decision making and, and, and behind the scenes is where it all needs to start. Now, National Association of Black Journalists has done a good job um, trying to push that agenda and trying to move that forward. But, um, you know, when you look at the number of media outlets out there right now, it's 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 really been just a drop in the bucket, and we have not gotten the the traction that we really really need uh, as a community, as, as brown people on the whole. Um, and and I I mean I really feel strongly about it because I I look at some of these broadcasts, especially when I travel around the country, and I just say, wow, we we need to to show the importance of diversity in each and every community because your broadcast should reflect your community and the diversity and because that's what makes it special. That's what makes this country special. Yeah, absolutely. And this is actually a good transition to the next segment, but you're right. We don't know about the back end because as I said before the podcast was, we don't hear about the great things of journalism. We really mm -hmm. just don't. I mean, if all the, the schools that I've been to, people who I've talked to, talking to my kids, even my in my own um, educational background, you always hear about lawyers and doctors being the top two, maybe healthcare being the third, and anything else after that then comes administrative assistance and then technology. So those are like the first, the top five, okay, that people mm -hmm. talk about. But they don't talk about the other things that make things run in the background. What my husband always says all, all the time, they need to make a movie just about the cameraman <laughs> that mm -hmm. goes out and do the fantastic <laughs> things that they do and shoot the yeah. shots. And how do one operate all the different commercials and things that just happen on cue? And those mm -hmm. are the those are the people that actually run the television station 24 hours a day. So it's really nice to know that you're actually stepping up and saying there's not enough diversity, whether it's black, white, Asian, doesn't matter. There's not enough mm -hmm diversity to make it equal and there is no advertisement for that and on top of that when if you I guarantee you if you kind of go out there and you do a search for journalism or any kind of that you're not going to see a lot of positions that are for major television stations you'll see them for like the little small ones but you're not going to really right. see a really good presence for that and I really want to use this platform to let all all our listeners know there is there is opportunity in journalism there is mm -hmm. opportunity and people who are decision makers need to give folks a chance. So one of the things we want to talk about in this podcast was the influence of media when it comes to small businesses. And I want to give you an opportunity to, to have you talk about that because based on what we was you were saying to me that you're kind of passionate about it and just kind of explain to the listeners what that passion is all about. Yeah, you know, I I, I think uh, a lot of small businesses kind of miss the mark because they don't understand how to even go about contacting the media to get exposure for the great things that they're doing in the community. Um, and and it if you if you frame it as a news item, you're more likely to gain traction with news uh, news gathering outlets as opposed to people in the newsroom thinking it, well, you, they're just looking for a free commercial. And that kind of exposure, it goes a long way towards, uh, number one, reinforcing your brand. So you let people know about what your core values are and your core objectives of your business, but also that you're part of the community. 
And when people see that you're part of the community, it has a, you know, one of those uh, kind of trickle down effects where people are drawn to you because they want to support you because they know that you're in the community and you believe in that community. You're not just there uh, for the greenback. And one of the things people don't understand is, well, especially right now, it, Okay, so you don't necessarily have to be on the broadcast to gain great exposure. Like I said, everything is driven towards our web and by our web presence. So if you're able to make contact through Twitter or through Facebook or through the station website with email, and you're able to get the media to come out and cover your event, well, if it doesn't go on, on the air, it's going to go on the website. And once you get that, that clip on the website, you're able to promote that through your social media networks, and hopefully you've got an integrated platform where you're getting a lot of, of digital traction. And that is just as powerful as having a spot on the broadcast at, at 5 p.m. or 6 p.m. Because remember, who, who's home at that hour? You know, a lot of us are still hustling, still trying to get it done at work or, or taking little Johnny to baseball and football practice. And a lot of us are not sitting down in front of the television at 530 or 6 o'clock. So even if you just get sent to the web, you still have that social media presence. And that digital presence is what is driving a lot of small business activity these days. And, and just take a look at our website or any website um, in your local area. And the first thing you see when you click on a news story is an advertisement. See, so that is an opportunity for revenue for our purposes, but it's also an opportunity for you to promote your small business as well. And it doesn't cost you anything, so I'm sure it runs in line with most small businesses' budgets. So just understanding you know, the process that we don't necessarily have to be on TV. If we can make it to the web, we're in great shape. And you can do that by doing the work for us. A lot of folks don't understand that if you send us some video, we, we, we like that. We appreciate that because we're always trying to do more with less anyway. So we, don't, we may not have a photographer. You know, tonight we might have three photographers and four reporters. So if you send us the video and we can put it on our web or put it on our broadcast um, and it's nice and clean, it's, it's high definition, and you send us some facts about what's going on, it's liable to make it to our broadcast. And if it doesn't, at the worst, it'll make it to our, uh, our web. And I think that is critical to, for people to understand, especially when they're in a new business or a small business that they're trying to grow. It's a nice promotable item. You can put it on your website. You can put it on your Facebook and say, hey, you know, we were future, featured by WLWT, and this is how, uh, this is the article right here. This is the clip right here. Just click on the clip to take a closer look. And that is almost instant validation for most businesses uh, because it, it shows you uh, in a good light, in a great light in terms of your community presence, and that is worth its weight in gold. And you, you almost can't ask for better advertising than to be featured on a, uh, on a clip for a local TV news station. Okay, so that is wonderful. I don't think a lot of people knew that. I know I didn't know that. So thank you for sharing that information. So I am going to play devil's advocate now because this is the fun thing I like to do anyway. Okay, mm -hmm. so WLWT, that is their process. But in your opinion, and based on the fact that you worked for so many other TV stations, I'm pretty sure they're not all are equal in terms of making sure that your stuff gets to the web or the platform. What are some of the other ways or maybe talk about um, some of the pitfalls that small businesses run into when they're trying to get on TV or the web? Because that was a lot of information you, sh you share for your TV station, but I guess I'm asking mm -hmm. about what the other TV stations do or some of the other pitfalls we need to watch out for. Yeah. So when I've been out to talk to people about this, this very subject, you know, I, I start off with relationships. And I think relationships are key. If you are in a big city, it's much more difficult to get your stuff on the web or on television just because they have so much going on and so few resources dedicated to covering the news. Washington, D.C., WRC, for example, I did an internship there when I was in uh, 
when I was in college, and, and, and I know how crazy a news day can be around there. But if you forge a relationship and you can meet the assignment desk person or one of the reporters or – uh, one of the people in the traffic department or one of the cameramen. It's all about relationships. You know, and if you have a relationship on the inside, you can try to monetize that. And that's where it starts. We have people that come by all the time and drop off their business cards or ask our assignment desk people to, to go to lunch with them, spend a few minutes with them just to introduce themselves and say, you know, here's who we are. And, you know, we'd appreciate it if, you know, when, when we send you a note, you can just take a few minutes to take a good look at it. If it warrants some news coverage, in your opinion, please, you know, contact us. So I would say start with relationships, no matter where you are. When I, when I found the individual to help me uh, get my career started, I was living in uh, Westchester County right outside of New York City. And I had run into one of the, the main anchors at uh, WCBS. And I got to talking with Reggie, and Reggie and I became best friends. He would look at my tape, and it was awful. And he would look at my stuff and tell me how to fix it. But it all started with a relationship because I called him. I told him what I needed. He spent a few minutes with me. And next thing you know, here I am with a contact at WCBS-TV in New York. And and that's how most businesses work. I, I tell my sons all the time, your your network will determine your net worth. So if you have a nice network and you start developing those relationships and massage them, because trust me, we want we want to develop sources. We want resources in the community and we want people calling us and telling us when they have news items. Because it may be uh, the car wash for the football team today, but the next time it might be a major breaking news story that's happening in your neighborhood and you and I have met for lunch and now you pick up the phone and call me and say, hey, I've got this video off my cell phone that I'm about to send over to you of the police standoff that's happening down the street. That's how we get all our news. All our best stuff mm -hmm. comes from sources that we've cultivated and people in the community that trust us and that we have a relationship with. So it works the same for small business. If you're out there trying to, 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 to sell your wares and trying to make a name for yourself, you've got to have relationships with people and you've got to work the phones and sometimes get up off your duff and get down to the local coffee shop and maybe meet an assignment desk person or meet one of the reporters. Um, find out where they're going to be. We, we oftentimes, and this, is, and this is true of most stations around the country, they will post the events that they're going to be at, that talent is going to be at. So when you see them, Drop them a card, you know, strike up a conversation with them, cultivate the resource, because that's, that's where it all begins. And, and that's, that holds true for any city around the country. Every reporter wants resources and wants sources in the community. Okay. So, you know, that is fabulous. I'm glad that you said that. This, this is just another proven indication that networking is key to a small Absolutely. business. We can't always operate out of our house as much as we would love to or mm -hmm. operate in, on email and things of that nature. We have to get out and really network with people and make a conscious effort to just get out there and just do our thing and not be afraid. And that's one of the reasons why this podcast exists, because I want people to come out and stand up and say, I am here. Do you know who I am? Mm -hmm. This is what I can offer. And even if you get a no, like, you know, I think uh, my boy, Joe or Olstein, he used to say the the, the hundredth <laughs> no. And you might get that and feel depressed, but the 101 might be a yes. So right. we're going to right. get tons of no's. I've gotten no's, but we mm -hmm. can't give up and we have to keep doing it. And, you know, those are some of the things that we have to do. Now, are there any other um, problems or issues that you want to talk about in terms of the influences for small businesses, particularly for the minority community? Um, I know one of them is all that you said already about just being able to come out and all that. But I, I don't know what other issues that might be arising from your point of view, from a media standpoint that you may want to share with everyone on this podcast. No, just uh, be, be available and be consistent. 
is what I would say. Uh, make sure that you know your contact numbers are up to date. Your website is working properly. Um, you're, you're you're busy on your social media, and you're making sure that um, your brand is protected. You know because you always want to keep an eye on that brand. Uh, you have to be so careful with the kinds of statements and the kind of political stances that you're taking on social media because. I mean, we, we've got software here where we, we can go back and find the very first tweet that your business put out. So if you're involved in a controversial story, I mean, we have resources here to go through, you know, social media to find out, you know, exactly what the background is. So you want to be careful with that stuff because it, 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 it's just the accusation that does in a business. You, you don't even sometimes need to prove it, as we've seen, because so much – is flooding the social media airwaves, and once it starts going viral, it's hard to rein it back in. So you really want to be careful about the, the kinds of posts that you make. You want them to be lively and engaging, but you want them to be tasteful as well, and you want it to reflect your core values when, when you start talking about you know, who we are as a business, and you don't want to have stuff on there that draws uh, negative attention to your social media profile because it's, 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 a, it's a standing, uh, basically, advertisement of who you are. And so if you're if, if – you're, irresponsible with it, it's, it's going to shine badly on your business and, and on your core values as, as a company that's trying to grow. And it's going to be made that much more difficult, especially when you're trying to get loans and you're trying to uh, maneuver yourself and, and get contracts. And, you know, one of the, I mean, we see people losing jobs over their careless Facebook and, and Twitter posts and Snapchat pictures and the things that they've just used bad judgment on. So, yeah, my rule of thumb for, for my boys I tell them if if you don't want your grandmother to see it, then don't put it on Twitter or Instagram. Absolutely. If, 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 Absolutely. So. I can't tell you. I'm I'm telling you, Mark. <laughs> I can't stress enough how many times I tell people that if you don't want your private business on social media, please don't put it out there. You know, mm -hmm. a lot of us who have small businesses, that we have our personal. Facebook or Instagram and then we have our business and honestly mm -hmm. just because you can speak your free mind on your personal don't mean people are not going to find out about it you can right. have your business one out there all day but like you said you have to be consistent if people go to my Facebook they're not going to see anything derogatory that's different from my page to my business page because I want to control what the media or whoever sees about me and you're absolutely right people do lose their jobs and they cannot even get jobs right. based on their social media and so it is really really important to make sure that what you post represents you you need to make sure that the people who you are connected with also represents you because you can't control what other people post but you can control what you post right, right. so right. if you're making friends with people who are posting different things that is not in line with your character, guess what? When you go out there and try to find a job, you can listen to the other lady who talked about that. They're going to Google you. They're going to look mm -hmm. you up. And if you're not smart enough to do your privacy on your page, you will be seen through someone else's Facebook account or through your friend's Twitter account because you are connected. And right. it is really important, and I can't stress that enough. So I'm glad you brought that up. So go ahead and continue. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I just had to say that. Oh, no, no, you're absolutely right because you, it's your brand. And once you tarnish the brand, it's hard to get it shiny once again. So folks, whether it's personal or whether it's their business brand, I mean, you have to be so careful. The Trump campaign taught us a lot about who people really are and how far some people are willing to go. And you just can't go there when you're trying to, to offer a service to the public because you, you, you can't control other people's interpretation of what you're posting. A classic example I give people is the, the, the young lady in Atlanta who was a, a beautiful black woman who happened to be kind of curvy and posted those pictures to her social media site. Well, the district said these are inappropriate. You know, most people looked at it and said, oh, okay, here's a, here's a gorgeous African-American woman. But the district said, no, this is not the image we want to project and wanted, wanted to terminate her. 
So it's all in the eye of the beholder. And we could argue for days about whether or not that's fair or unfair, but the district employs her. So she's got to live up to the district standards. You know, whether we like it or not, your employer gets to set the rules. So you can't, you can't measure how somebody is going to react to something that you post. Um, and, and, and you're not going to get an opportunity to explain it to them. Just as if the admissions uh, office over at American University is looking at a student's uh, social media profile. They're not going to tell them, well, you know what, we're not taking you because of this Facebook post here, and it doesn't. It's not in line with the image that we want to project here at our university. They're not going to tell you that. They're just going to send you a rejection letter. So it's, 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 it's happening more and more. We see it all the time. I, w I was talking to some kids earlier this year uh, about how the University of Michigan had catfished uh, some of their players to teach them a lesson about social media. I mean, universities are hiring companies to monitor social media profiles in order to make sure that each and every one of their kids, especially their scholarship athletes, are constantly, constantly protecting the brand, their own brand, as well as the university's brand. So it, you're always, you're always representing the university when you play football at University of Michigan or basketball at Kentucky. So you have to be aware of that fact. And when you're going to work for WLWT, the first thing people are going to do is say, okay, what's your social media handles? We need to check out your, your Facebook page. We need to check out your Instagram posts just to make sure that our philosophy is and our core values and brand are not going to be tarnished by what you bring to our organization. So it's critical. It's just like when people go to do research on a company, they want to hire somebody to come fix the garage door. Well, you know, when they look up those reviews and they look up their social media and see what kind of feedback people are offering, it, 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 it will determine the, the, whether or not they get that business or not. So and everybody wants the business. Right. So it is, it, is, it, is, it is critical. It's almost like customer service uh, on steroids because you ha the, the customer is always right. And you have to err on the side of caution every single time. Absolutely. You couldn't have said it even, you couldn't have said it better, Mark. I'm just telling you. <laughs> I mean, if you really don't have a good social media presence, this is a great opportunity and a perfect opportunity to call me, to call one of the career coaches here to help you build that. Because mm -hmm. I can tell you for my my own self that, okay, so I have a personal media thing. I have my own personal thoughts that go out there. Nothing serious. But when I made the commitment to just do Austin Tech and look at the brand and everything, I literally went to my personal and I deleted maybe like four years of posts from maybe people who I knew or family members who may have been on my timeline that don't represent mm -hmm. what my brand is. And yes, I'm going to miss those pictures, but you know, you can download those things and save them. Yeah. But see, I'm interested in making sure that my brand is protected because I'm also looking at my full-time career. I'm also looking at how I can be a well-qualified candidate for any position that I apply for. And so mm -hmm. when people look at my platform, they're going to see, and I'm very transparent with them when I go for a full-time job, even the one, the latest one that I'm at, I tell them I do Austin Tech on the side. I teach career development and you can look at my website and you can see the things that I'm doing because I'm very transparent with that. Um, mm -hmm. I control what they want to see. And so if you don't have a LinkedIn account that is built up with people who can vet your skills and who can speak up for you. And, mm -hmm. and even if it's just one recommendation that speaks volume, because now someone is actually stepping up and saying, Hey, I know this person she has, or he has good character and they can see how they can, they can see how you will fit into the environment. It's always have been that. And that is really the core key reason why we have resumes. It's not just mm -hmm. to represent you. It's for them to see how you fit in their environment. And mm -hmm. if you kind of look at it that way, then you're going to think twice before you say, okay, I'm going to be friends with this person or I'm going to allow this post on my timeline. I personally screen everything that goes on my timeline.
So yeah. if it doesn't go with my core values, it doesn't go on my timeline. Well, and and now that there's no excuse for uh, literally crazy stuff showing up on your post because with Facebook and and uh, some of these other social media sites, you can set it so that you have to review it first before it goes on there. I mean, you, you just can't go posting stuff to our WLWT page because we review everything we put up there because we want to protect our brand. So in this day and age, there's really no excuse for a business uh, Facebook page to let crazy stuff show up on their on their uh, on their page because it, it it you're the shepherd. You're you're keeping watch. And so if you're not doing that, you're, you're not being responsible for your brand. Okay. So that was a really good conversation. We could go on and on. <laughs> we could go on and on with this conversation because I think it's hot. I'm pretty sure people are going to want to hear more of that. But you know what? I want to hear about your upcoming book that's coming out because this, this is a platform that also showcases authors. So tell us about your book and what drove you or your passion to write the book. Yeah, you know what? I'm working on a book on parenting for for uh, kids in the digital age because I, it, what kids are facing right now is so difficult. Um, we we just recently our family suffered uh, somewhat of a tragedy. Our son was charged with some some very serious crimes, and we're we're trying to help him get through this. And we saw it all play out on social media, and we were heartbroken that we didn't take a harder and tougher stance with him about it. But, you know, the, the older he got, the more difficult it became. And I want parents to understand that, number one, you have to trust your instinct about what these kids are exposed to. Because in some of the research that I found was just blowing me away. Like, for instance, young men, their brains are not fully developed until almost their, their late 20s, early 30s. And I had no idea... Um, that that was the case, and because I kept thinking to myself, okay, well, you know, he's going to snap out of this, and you know, maybe he's going to mature overnight, and but that's not the case. And once they get involved with this kind of alternate reality that exists on social media, um, it can really go bad in a hurry. And I want to warn parents, and I want to let parents know that it's okay to trust your gut and to question your kids and to have conversations about your kids, about what they're hoping to prove. I mean, you, you can talk to them without it becoming a contentious battle. And you can help them understand why it's important that they protect their brands as well. And after what my wife and I have, have been going through over the past uh, year or so with, with, with our son, who's a graduate of Howard University with an economics degree and military service on the USS Enterprise, one of the most storied battleships in our, our military's history, um, we just want other parents to not have to go through that pain. And we're going to tell this story to as many people that as, as will listen and hope that, you know, if we can save one family from this kind of pain, um, we, we hope to do so because it, these kids are inundated with so much content on these computers. And they're on their phone and their computer all day, by the way. If these parents haven't looked, you don't have to fight with your kids for the cable remote because they're not picking it up. <laughs> they're going to their laptop. They're going to their iPad. They're going to whatever digital device they use. And that's where they're seeing this stuff. I mean, and think about some of the stuff that's on there now, and from porn to violence to the music. Um, one of my son's good friends and, and college teammates at Howard University told me that, that our son was just enamored with the street life and the music. And, you know, we don't think about the influence that this stuff has on our kids, which is why we have to keep the lines of communication open. Um, communication has been my passion. Um, I can't remember the last time I went a day without having a conversation with somebody. And we know that the best communicators win every single time in business, in life, um, in sports, wherever it is. And so I want to help people understand 
that um, there's a way to communicate without being confrontational, with, without making uh, a young person feel inadequate, um, and help them understand um, what they're dealing with, what they're seeing, because there is so much online now that needs context for these young people. And it, it, it has consumed me, as a matter of fact, over these pa- over this past year. And, and the more and more we turn on the news, I mean, you see these kids being radicalized to go fight for ISIS. Um, you see kids that are playing to a stack. I mean, they basically stack the audience. So anyone who doesn't agree with what they're posting, well, you know what? You're going to be blocked. So moms and dads need to be on these sites. They need to be monitoring who these kids are talking to, what they're talking about, and they need to have access. And um, they need to have conversations and provide context for their kids or else they're going to find themselves down the road, you know, staring at some at, at some very difficult situations, some of which you won't be able to help your children. And there's no worse feeling than not being able to help your child. I mean, if you've ever had a sick child. You you know how bad you feel when they don't feel well and all you want to do is hold them and squeeze them and love them. And, you know, if you enter the system, you know, the system has them now. And I have I have so many friends and family members that that grew up in D.C. and we watched the system uh, you know, during the crack uh, cocaine epidemic back in the late 80s and the early 90s. And it was heartbreaking to watch what was happening to families um, and some of my own cousins and friends that fell victim to it. And once you become a part of that system, there's nothing that mom and dad can do for you. So you got to talk to them now or else the court system will talk to them later. And communication, yeah. communication is mm-hmm. the key. Is the key. First of all, I want to just say I'm sorry to hear about your son. There are so many people, parents like yourself, who is going through the same thing. Oh, thank um, you. I, I think that one, we have to make sure that we know that you tell him that you are there for him, and they make these mistakes. And just so happened, I had a a young lady on a podcast who was talking about the number one incarceration rate for women in in Mm. Oklahoma and some of the other states. And also the movie that I saw with another friend of mine, which was incarcerating the U.S., where they talked about nonviolent offenders going to jail for a small different you know small little minute things like three to five or five to ten depending on what it was and it's just so unfortunate that our young children has fallen prey to that i will say that because i had grew up in a in a family that was originally a tight-knit family and drugs kind of came into play and i literally saw my family change from a very close family to a very violent family um and when i say violent i don't mean hitting or anything like that but it, to me, you go from loving and going on trips and having cookouts to nobody talking to each other and there's arguments and people are just disparate and, and off on their own devices. And then you see your cousins and other generations following behind that. You see what the effects of drugs and alcohol and gangs take toll yeah. on a family and break it up. So for me yeah. personally, I made it my business to make sure that I knew exactly what and who and where they were dealing with the computer. Um, I Mm -hmm. made it my business to get on my Wi-Fi router and I actually put in keywords so that if they typed in a certain keyword on the computer, it would instantly block that. And I will periodically, every week, will go through the logs to see where they visited. I didn't have to Mm -hmm. physically get on their computer to do that. There's a way you can do that. But I did it through the router. And if I saw that there was a website that was questionable or something, I would ask them about it. And I wasn't afraid to ask them why are you on this website and what purpose does it serve even down to youtube i had to block youtube Mm -hmm. for six months because when youtube really was getting out there there was so much violence on youtube there was all this porn stuff and and honestly my child actually suffered 
um, he was he was actually watching videos, which was harmless. And then there was a time where they were doing videos, and then at the very end of the video, they would put a really scary picture on the end, like a oh, devil yeah. or I've something horrible. That. Yeah, and it actually terrified my son to the point where um, it didn't matter what video that he would do. It could be a SpongeBob video, or it could be a Walt Disney video, and they would put that that scary video on the end, and he couldn't sleep with the lights on. He couldn't go to the bathroom with the lights off. Okay, so, um, right. so it just it, it got to the point where I had to block YouTube for like six months, and I had to do some detox <laughs> with him. Mm -hmm. But in the end, I know now that I know where they are on the internet, and I know that they're right. safe. But a lot of kids fall through the cracks because we as parents are not being proactive enough enough to go and ask those questions or to investigate because they think, oh, he's in his room or she's in his room and they're safe. They're not safe right. because honestly, what they're doing on the internet is no different than going out in the world and you have no idea where they are where because they are, they are yep. talking to God knows how many people who are across the world who's sitting behind a computer with whatever intent that they may have to gain access to communicate with your child. And right. they can, it could be a grown person trying to portray or be a young person. It could be a man trying to be a woman. You just, you have no idea who's on the other right. end of that computer. And so part of my career training is about internet privacy. Mm. I let them know that in, in just in the last three sessions that I did at the schools, I made it a point to spend at least 10 minutes telling them how to go on Facebook Facebook and set your privacy. Um, go on there and make sure that anybody you do not know, you get them off your friends list. If you don't know right. them, they don't need to be your friend. Also, talking about internet privacy, it's just pretty much what I was saying to you about you never know who's on the other end of the computer. And also being aware of the different things that are on the internet that could really harm them. And, mm -hmm. uh, it's, and you know, they don't think that's coming. <laughs> But it's so needed because right. and it's not that it's the parents fault It's really nobody's fault. It's just not knowing, not understanding that this could be happening. Um, our children is pretty much exposed to the world through yep. the Internet and the media. And I'm pretty sure being though you've been in the business for such a long time, I know it's heart wrenching that you really don't have that much power to control what is on the media. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're almost powerless um, because it, 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 the demand is there and it's insatiable. You almost can't feed the beast enough. And, um, you know, there are plenty of stories that I would love to kill on a regular basis. Um, but in the end, we're, we're here to inform and not okay. to incite. And, and that seems to right now at least <laughs> kind of drives our coverage um right. is the is the need for information but uh, like you said there's so much out there and you really have to be vigilant and you really have to pay attention where they're going and where they've been so you can offer some context and and help them understand you know what they just saw or what just happened but if you don't know they're left to try to figure it out on their own and young people these days just they don't have that frame of reference and and you know we wouldn't have either had we been exposed to it and right. but things have changed so dramatically i mean if you think about what they're seeing on television now you know from, from these dating shows to the music um to the language that they're allowed to use to late night television um and then you put it on the internet and you you multiply it exponentially it, it, you you have to be conversating with these kids and you have to keep those lines of communication open so they are not afraid to come to you and say hey look i saw this and i need some help understanding what it is and that's that's where it all begins that's how you keep them balanced and keep them from running toward danger we okay. just had a story ten we just had a story tonight of a, a a young girl that met a guy um on an app and they drove her from Indiana into Cincinnati, and they were torturing her. And fortunately, um, somebody called the police, and they got a break, and they were able to find her. Her parents were able to track her down through the computer, 
Um, and thank goodness she wasn't on her phone and had her phone with her, or they would have never been able to find her. But once they went through her computer, they were able to track down who she'd been talking to and where they were going, and they were able to pinpoint her location. So they got a, a big, huge break. But it, it, it's so critical to understand where they are. Exactly. And you know what? This is one of those conversations that could raise so many different issues and reasons why we should really monitor what our kids do. And also look at the fact that our kids are a future. These are the people mm-hmm. who is going to carry forth our business are their careers, their children mm-hmm. and their children's children. And so this conversation is not just about the small business and how it influences really how it influence all of us and how we need to be more responsible for that influence. And so I want to kind of wrap up the podcast because I'm pretty sure we need to have another podcast about <laughs> about internet <laughs> privacy because this is so good. But since this is a networking event and we have a lot of people listening to this podcast, mm-hmm. what do you need from those who are listening and participating to help you in your cause in terms of journalism, minority business, and helping to fix the influence of media today? Yeah, well, you know, personally, it's about exposure. Um, I, I would just make an appeal to, to folks to educate themselves and expose themselves to how the media works. Don't be afraid to fire off emails. We answer all our emails and, and try to interact as much as possible with people on social media. With social media, it's as, it's as easy as ever to contact television stations and newspaper organizations and media outlets um, and demand the answers that you'd like. Uh, personally, I have um, my website is up and running at MarkHayesConsulting.com. And um, any and all feedback is appreciated. And if you have any business leads for me, I would cer- cer- certainly appreciate it. And I'll be working on that book, and I will definitely let you know um, when it's when it's done and when I start promoting that. And um, I, I, I just also would like to make an appeal to our community to to uplift each other and to support one another. Every other community does it. We should be able to do it as well. Um, it doesn't take much. It just takes a little bit of effort, and it just takes a, a, a little bit more energy to go out and say, you know what, here's a lead for so-and-so. I'm going to pass it along. I mean, it's as simple as an email sometimes, and it could make all the di- – it could be – the push that somebody needs to land that big contract that that makes a difference. It, it could be generational wealth. We don't know. But until we start supporting each other and lifting each other up, we're going to be spinning our wheels. And that's why I wanted to be a part of this podcast, to, to share the information and the expertise that I have and to help people expose themselves to other opportunities. And, you know, we can do that uh, continuously for each other. Uh, it, it, it just makes us that much stronger, and it gives us all a better chance to succeed. Absolutely. This is why this podcast is this, as you said, because like everyone else who's been here, like all 56 of you who've been on this podcast, which is phenomenal, I'm really trying to build a community of resources, a community where we can actually leverage and put into action the solutions that we see out here today to fix and change our mindset that we are, as a community, is much better than what's being portrayed today. And we cannot keep continuing to fall into the same bucket hole of drugs, guns, problems with our health, problems with our finance, to really build a community community where we can economically be strong as well and through communication information sharing collaboration patroning sponsoring you name it this is what it's going to take for us to stand up and stand out and so I'm encouraging everybody who's listening to this podcast and to all the podcasts that you're going to hear me say is that we have to keep lifting each other up by the books use the tools talk to someone his contact information is going to be on this page you can definitely contact me let's schedule an event let's get some stuff going um this is not a plea this is pretty much a fact that this is what we have to do 
but we have to change our mindset and you guys are listening have to also be willing to put in a little bit of work as Mark said and so with that I want to thank you Mark for being on the podcast today and raising this issue it is so needed out here today I'm so glad that we met because again as I said it's so hard to find someone who's in media or journalism that will come and speak out on behalf of the minority community and I want to thank you for that. Absolutely. Thanks so much. It's been an honor and a privilege. Thanks so much for having me.